In the history of the Chinese nation, there has been only one woman to claim the title of emperor for herself. This remarkable woman is the Empress Wu. Before studying her reign, it is important to understand that owing to several factors, the historical records are somewhat unreliable. A foremost concern is that Wu's rule was during a period that was heavily influenced by Confucian ideas. These beliefs prohibited a woman from being the head of state. Thus, many historians were prejudiced against Wu. Confucian thought encouraged historical records to provide lessons to the future. So by highlighting and exaggerating the wrongdoings of the Empress, they would be providing an example of the horrible rule of women. Empress Wu also exercised her own control over the historical record. She appointed only people that she knew would be kind to her as court historians. So it's with careful analysis that the history of Empress Wu is approached. Wu, Wu rose in standing to become the Empress of Kaohsiung. After his death, she became the head of state. Important aspects of her rule include her support of Buddhism and her approach towards bureaucracy. Wu's family, although of some importance, was not part of the elite social class. At the age of 13, Wu left her family for the palace to become a concubine to the Emperor Tai Xiang. Once Wu arrived at court, she set out to distinguish herself. One of the incidences of her early history on the court was recounted by Wu to a minister. Tai Xiang had a very wild horse whom no one could master. I was then a palace girl, and standing by his side, said, I can control him, but I shall need three things first. An iron whip, second, an iron mace, and third, a dagger. If the iron whip does not bring him to obedience, I will use the iron mace to beat his head, and if that does not do it, I will use the iron dagger and cut his throat. This story not only made the point to the former emperor, but also to the minister to whom she was speaking. This attitude of steadfast determinedness and disregard for the advice of her ministers is a theme that can be seen throughout her reign. It is also during this time as a concubine that Wu meets, and by some accounts seduces, the crown prince Cao Xiang. As Wu never bore any children to Tai Xiang, by tradition she should have gone to a convent at the time of his death. In the first of many acts committed in defiance of tradition, Wu left the convent and entered into the harem of Cao Xiang. Once appointed as a member of Cao Xiang's court, Wu set forth to secure her position as his primary interest and to replace the current empress. To accomplish this goal, Wu had to surpass two women, Empress Wang and Cao Xiang's favorite concubine. Wu would report acts they committed to the emperor, turning his favor against them. She even went as far as to implicate Wang in the death of her newborn daughter. Eventually, Wu became the primary interest of Cao Xiang, and between 653 and 654 bore him two sons. With an heir established, Cao Xiang sought the approval of his ministers to divorce Empress Wang and elevate Wu to the post. The ministers strongly disapproved the appointment of Wu because of her low birth and the issue of incest. However, Cao Xiang persisted, and by 656, Wu became the empress. In a manner that would soon become typical of her rule, Wu removed from power those ministers who opposed her appointment and ordered the death of her challengers. In the first year of her reign as empress, a murder was committed which many texts attribute to Wu. There is a celebration and Wu's relations were called to the capital from their provincial posts. Among her family was a niece. Cao Sung was greatly impressed with her beauty and desired her as a concubine. Shortly after a dinner celebration, she died of poisoning. Wu's nephews were sent to jail because of this incident. However, many texts blame Wu. An alternative theory makes the claim that it is much more likely that the poisoning was committed by the Empress's mother, who was seeking to protect the interests of her daughter. This theme of vilifying Wu can again be seen as she was next blamed for the murder of two crown princes. The death of Prince Hung is another case where Wu was charged with committing murder. In this case, Hung died shortly after an altercation with Empress Wu. However, there is much evidence to support the idea that it was not Wu's fault. Foremost, Hung died in the presence of his father, and as Cao Song was the man from whom Wu derived her power, it is unlikely that she would have done anything to jeopardize her position with him. The following crown prince committed suicide after being prosecuted for treason by the Empress Wu. Critics accredit his death to the Empress, although it was not she who originally levied the charges. It was shortly after the deaths of the two crown princes that the Emperor Cao Song died in 683. Following the death of Cao Song, Wu continued her rise to power, first serving as regent and later ascending to the throne herself.
Although many critics fault Empress Wu, claiming that she had plans to usurp the throne from the very beginning, it is much more likely that she formed her dynasty out of what she saw as a necessity. In 684, Emperor Chung Sung came to power. He was married to a woman who had no interest in the rules of propriety. When a member of court confronted him about his empress's abuse of her position, he foolishly replied that he could give her the entire empire if he so chose. He was then charged with treason, removed from the throne, and replaced with his brother Zhui Sang, who had no desire to be emperor. Wu claimed that he had a speech impediment that prevented him from appearing in court. She therefore took over the power of holding court and making official decisions. The legality of Wu's actions were questioned by many in the court, but the position of regent was loosely defined, and Wu took advantage of this. In order to legitimize her authority, Wu turned to the leading thought tradition of the time, Confucianism, and her personal tradition of Buddhism. Confucianism was the major ideological belief of most high-ranking officials and members of the court. It was therefore very important for Wu to appease these individuals. This was no easy task, however, as the Confucian tradition is very restrictive on the role of women. The female principle, the yin, was to be ruled and submissive to the male yang. Wu was an intelligent woman. She carefully studied Confucian doctrine. It was through this study that she was able to craft an analogy between the Confucian ideal of the relationship between a mother and her children to the relationship between the empress and her people. In order to establish herself as a legitimate ruler, Empress Wu had to compete with Confucian ideals. Conversely, Buddhism was a great aid to her rule. Buddhism was the patron religion during the reign of Empress Wu. With the Confucian tradition strongly opposed to a woman ruler, Wu needed a source of legitimization. She turned to Buddhism, the tradition in which she had been raised. During the 4th century in China, there arose a devotion to the future Buddha, Maitreya. It was said she would return to the world as a universal monarch in the last Dharma and bring about a new golden age. Between 683 and 684, several Buddhist relics were discovered, and there was a general domestic unrest that led many to believe that the end of time was near. The Great Cloud Sutra was also discovered during this time, and commentary was added to it which claimed that Maitreya had been reborn as Empress Wu. In order to expound the message of the Great Cloud Sutra, temples were founded in every prefecture. Over 1,000 monks were ordained for the specific purpose of chanting and explaining this sutra to the people. This is a powerful example of Wu's manipulative use of religion to justify her rule and gain support. There are other examples, however, that show Wu's support and belief in Buddhism were of a much more genuine nature. Beyond the construction of many temples, Wu was a great patron of Buddhism. For example, Wu decreed two laws that were Buddhist in nature. The first was a ban on the butchering of fish and animals. This is in keeping with the Buddha's teaching of non-violence towards sentient beings. The second law passed by Wu made crimes committed against temples and monasteries equal in punishment to those committed against state property. This law raised Buddhism to a level that it had not been. It equated the value of the empire with that of Buddhism. Wu's true support of Buddhism can also be seen in the commentary of her rule provided by monks outside her influence. Fa Xiang, a noted Buddhist scholar and follower of the Garland School, and Hui Qi, a member of the P Pure Land Sect, both praised Wu, referring to her as a bodhisattva, and praising her efforts to support and expand Buddhism. It can thus be seen that the relationship between Wu and Buddhism was symbiotic. Wu benefited by obtaining a source of legitimization, while Buddhism benefited by having a ruler that supported it financially and philosophically. With the legitimizing force of Buddhism behind her, Wu was nearly ready to abandon her role as regent and seize the throne for herself. Wu began the process of recruiting men of virtue. These were men that were either recommended by high-ranking officials or who scored well in the examinations. This was a new practice that limited the power of the elite members of society and succeeded in creating a large, talented bureaucracy that was loyal to the empress. This attempt did not go unnoticed by the aristocracy, particularly members of the clan of Kaosong, the Lees. During the later period of Wu's rule as regent, the Li clan mounted two unsuccessful rebellion attempts. The first had a serious impact upon the rest of Wu's rule. Under constant fear of rebellion and overthrow, Wu instituted what would become known as a reign of terror, a system built of secret informants that led to the death of thousands of people over the six-year period it lasted. 
During this time, the court was overrun with fear, and few dared to openly criticize the empress. The Second Rebellion never made it beyond the stages of a conspiracy. In 688, a festival was held to celebrate the erection of the Ming Tang, or Great Hall of Light. All of the Li princes were invited to attend, and they developed a plan to overthrow Wu. However, Wu discovered the conspiracy and subsequently exiled or sentenced to death most of the Li clan. Shortly following this display of determinedness, Wu continued her rise in power and usurped the throne, declaring herself emperor. In 690, Empress Wu declared the new Chao dynasty. Her rule was characterized by